Hi, it's great to see you all. Um, you're spread out across the room. If, it were, if I had my druthers, I would probably give this keynote while walking back and forth between every piece of this room. Um, but I can't do that because there would be all kinds of mic feedback and the camera wouldn't be able to follow me. So I'm an, I've got like uh, marching orders here. Um, so my talk today is called Centering Teaching. And I was recently asked the question, um, I, I do a lot of advocacy work around compassion and how we show compassion to our students. Um, and also do research on moments when we do not show compassion to our students or when our colleagues don't. And it's a difficult, it's a difficult kind of work, this sharing, uh, showing of compassion. Someone asked me, in, in just like a set of best practices, um, which I'm not a big fan of best practices in general, but in a set of best practices, can you tell me how I can show compassion to my students? And I thought to myself, like, what's the one thing, what's the one thing that we can do to show compassion to our stu students and show our students that we are people of compassion? And my answer was to ask compassion of them and to do that very um, vocally and to do that very um, explicitly, sometimes on the first day of class. So it's something that I do in a lot of my teaching and I'm gonna do it in this keynote, which is to ask compassion of all of you. And I'm gonna start by telling you that the next slide is one, so my work is in open education, open pedagogy, radical pedagogy, critical pedagogy. My work is all over the internet. I'm a relatively public person. Usually almost everything I do is free to the open internet. Um, I'm going to ask explicitly three times during, or about three slides in this presentation that you not share them to the open internet. I've shared my slides, so I built these slides for most of the web. There's a few things here that are just for all of you in this room. Um, the next slide is one of those. And so uh, I'd prefer if you did not take pictures of this slide, you're welcome to talk about what I did and it'll show up on the, it'll show up on the live stream. So it's not, it's not a strict rule, um, but essentially to ask you for something. Oh, to be humble while I figure out why my slide is not advancing. Oh, there it is, it did it. <laughs> this is a picture of my daughter. Um, my daughter originally was going to be here. I had planned to bring her. In part, I had planned to bring her because I saw the thing about childcare and it made me feel welcome. It made me feel like this was a space for me. And in some ways, honestly, that Fact of that childcare is part of the reason I agreed to give this keynote. Currently, I don't go anywhere more than one or two overnights without my daughter with me. Um, she's actually not here with me because there was some last minute, she has a cold, basically. Um, there, <laughs> so I decided to leave her at home. Um, this is her, she's Hazel, she's a badass. Um, and she pretty much follows me everywhere. So in some ways, this keynote is a, as much about her as it is about all the other things that it's about. So starting with a bell hooks quote. Um, this is one that I use in so many presentations and the reason I use it is because I haven't quite figured it out yet. And it's, 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 it confounds me, uh, calls me to wonder. She writes, to teach in a manner that respects and cares for the souls of our students is essential if we are to provide the necessary conditions where learning can most deeply and intimately begin. It ends up becoming a Rorschach test for a lot of my presentations because I can always find something in this quote that relates to the presentation I'm about to give. The next slide I've got here is one about beginnings. How do we start? with the work of building spaces for compassionate teaching and learning. And so that's the piece that's interesting to me today, this idea of beginnings. What is a beginning? When is a beginning? Is it the first moment in a classroom? Is it uh, a small gesture, what I ask to be called? Uh, the platforms that we choose to use, the first words of our syllabus, a single tweet. Is it my asking you for compassion, my sharing the picture of my daughter? How does that act change everything else that goes on? My, this presentation has some dark spots. Um, it has some really, really dark spots. 
And in part, the reason I start with that picture of my daughter, it's to tell you that, and anyone who knows me, I'm, I even call myself on Twitter an irascible op optimist. Um, I'm an optimist, but there's some dark spots in my presentation today, so in some ways I wanna start with my, that picture of my daughter because it's a way of sharing my hope. Uh, my hope for the future, my hope that we can actually address some of the things I'm gonna talk about in my presentation. So, scaffolding. Um, if I think about beginnings, and I think about talk that I hear about beginnings in higher education, I hear a lot of talk about scaffolding. Um, there is a version of scaffolding that I love, and there's a version of scaffolding that I'm very suspicious of. The version of scaffolding that I love is the one that I see in the definition, in the etymology of the word, and the one I see in a picture like this that shows this marvelous structure. What is scaffolding? We build this structure around the outside of a building. And the, the, the scaffolding is designed, I'm not, a, I'm not a construction worker, but I think that the scaffolding is designed so that you can start anywhere and end up anywhere, essentially so that you can have hundreds of workers surrounding this building with infinite points of entry and infinite places that they can reach. That's usually not how I hear scaffolding talked about in education. Instead, the way I hear scaffolding more often talked about is a series of steps, a series of discrete steps. Uh, there's peak learning off in the distance, one step a little closer to peak learning, another step a little closer yet. And so the idea is that every learner, every student, every new teacher starts at the same place and then ends up at the same place, which I think is uh, hogwash, uh, is what I'll say. Um, I think students are unique and also teachers are unique. And the thing I'm gonna be doing in this presentation today is kind of moving back and forth between the idea about how do we show compassion for students and also how do we show compassion for teachers and the work of teaching. So scaffolding can create points of entry and access, but can also reduce complexity of learning to its detriment, uh, e.g. Bloom's taxonomy, Addy. I'm not universally opposed to these kinds of, well, no, maybe I am. Um, <laughs> well, no, not universally opposed, just generally opposed um, to these kinds of metrics or schema that take learning and try and parse it out into neat and tidy steps. It's not the way that everybody uses Bloom or uses Addy. Sure, there's really great ways to use these ideas, but I actually think there might be something flawed if that's where we're starting. Um, if we're starting from, so I just Googled Bloom's taxonomy and this is what came up. That does not look like learning to me. It also doesn't look like that lovely picture of a scaffold. So how can we take the heart of something like Bloom's and start from a different place than this? I often hear people say, well, if you start there, you can get somewhere profound and beautiful and wondrous. I don't, I, I don't think we get there when we start there. Um, I think we have to start somewhere else. Maybe we happen upon this stuff along the way and it helps us continue to move. Uh, but I don't think that's the place to start. So this picture behind me is, a, ta is a, a tag cloud from a tool called Tags Explorer, which is used for um, analyzing large numbers of participants and tweets within, a so within, uh, within the Twitter social network. And what you're seeing here was a MOOC that I ran called MOOC MOOC. This was back in, I ran it from 2012 until 2015. And what you're seeing is you're seeing all the participants in that MOOC. The swirling ball at the center is all the connections. The people on the outside are the people who participated but weren't necessarily drawn into the ball. So this is, if you actually saw this in real life, uh, it, would, it actually moves, this visualization. So it's this swirling, whirling ball. To me, it, it looks like this, this beautiful, wondrous, marvelous, inscrutable thing that's learning. And to look at it, I can't necessarily say, there's where the learning happened right there. Instead, I have to kind of take the language of poetry. I have to take, it feels ephemeral. It feels like something always just outside my grasp of understanding. And to me, I use this picture in order to say like, this is what learning looks like to me. It looks like this rolling ball that's drawing people in and letting them out and all of these connections. And so what I wonder is why we so often attempt to resolve this into this. Uh, black, the Blackboard Gradebook. Um, I can say that I universally can't stand the Blackboard Gradebook. Um, or this, uh, this is a Google search for, and these are just, this is a Google image search. Uh, this one's for learning objectives. 
Uh, great conversations that can be had around the idea of learning objectives, but too often those conversations turn into this, this kind of turning of learning objectives into this rote sequence of tasks. One of the things when I've had conversations with folks about learning objectives, my, the thing that I, I hate most about those conversations is when we say, oh, but how would we measure that? When we come up with a really great learning objective, but then we ask, well, how would we measure that? And then it gets thrown out. Um, for me, the best kind of a learning objective is one like to have an epiphany. Um, to, and literally, how would you measure that? So it's the best learning objective, and yet it's impossible to measure and impossible to put in a list or a stack like this. Um, here's more. This is learning outcomes. This is the quality matters rubric. I'm sorry if there are quality matters fans in here, but when you do this search, it shows you that there's something, there's something absurd underlying a lot of our work, which isn't to necessarily we shouldn't do it. It's not necessarily to say we should throw out things like the quality matters rubric. Instead, we should be turning to them with the same kind of scrutiny, the same kind of care, the same kind of wonder, and marveling at what they are, what they aren't, what they can be, what they're not yet, trying to figure them out and figure out how they work the same way that we would turn to acts of learning. Here's the Twitter rubric. Um, more absurdity here because a tweet used to be 140 characters, now it's 280 characters, and all of these Twitter rubrics all have way more than 280 characters. So to imagine that we can assess a tweet with this, so imagine that rolling ball, and now tell me, design a rubric to assess the success of that rolling ball. Um, I, I don't think that we can do it. I think it's useful conversation. So in my first teaching job 19 years ago, I was given a stock syllabus, and I was told that I couldn't change anything in the syllabus. Um, and what I was told, and I remember this quote so clearly, and I remember looking at the person, and this was a mentor that I cared deeply about, and still to this day, respect in a lot of ways. And I was confounded by what came back to me. The answer was, well, everything's there. Everything you need is right there. Why would you need anything else? And I'm thinking to myself, like, gosh, really? Like, I'm a human being. I'm complicated. I'm hopefully interesting. I have way different ideas about the world than you did who designed this. How is it possible to imagine that everything I would need would be right there? And then the follow-up. You don't necessarily want to change it anyway because you should be focusing on your research. To imagine that the work of teaching is made easier when it's turned into stock, when, when we use things like stock court courses. I've never found that kind of teaching to be easier. It's like a soul crushing is the thing I would call it. It doesn't allow me to bring any of who I am to the work, much less allow my students to be the unique people that they are in the work. Um, and so, um, and oh gosh, this little bit, the stock syllabus had one thing I could change. It had a blank where I could hand write in my name. <laughs> and so I was supposed to hand write in my name and then make photocopies of it and then pass it out to my students. And the fascinating thing about that was I just thought, that doesn't seem like good pedagogy because my students will then immediately recognize that I didn't create this thing. I am just a name penciled in that could be any other name. Um, and so it doesn't, it's not even that it was absurd or bewildering or soul crushing. It would also that it wasn't just was, it seemed, didn't seem like good pedagogy. It seemed like in order to pro approach that relationship, I had to bring my words to it. I had to bring myself to the work. So uh, long story short, I did change stuff. I changed a lot of stuff. Um, and some of that went under the radar. Like some of it was I just thought, well, I'm not doing it that way. That's a bad idea. And so I'm just going to change stuff. Um, so some of that was at the time, new teachers, smile and nod, maybe an eyebrow raised, and then go and actually do something that I felt like was a good way to approach this. Um, the interesting thing also at that moment is I think that that's the moment that I decided higher education pedagogy would be my research area. Because if somehow research was going to get in the way of my teaching, it just, like, that didn't necessarily make sense to me. So learning can't be reduced to uh, re packaged or packaged as a series of static self-contained content. Rather, learning happens in tangents. 
diversions, interruptions in a series of clauses, parentheticals, and gaps. One of the things that I like to do in my writing is have long strings of phrases separated by commas. Like any time that I try and describe what teaching and learning is, it becomes this long series of clauses, commas, that sort of never seem to end. And it's like, God, can he make up my, his mind? And the thing is, that, no, I can't make up my mind because it is something that I'm still trying to find. Uh, Paulo Freire also does that in his writing. And I sort of was inspired by him to have these long series of phrases separated by commas, the sense in which the sentence itself was pedagogical, trying to find itself as it proceeded. So a discussion of pedagogy needs to include a critical examination of our tools, what they afford, who they, ex uh, who they exclude, how they're monetized, what pedagogies they have already baked in, but it requires we also begin with a consideration of what we value the kinds of relationships we want to develop with students, why we gather together in places like universities, and how humans learn. So I think any discussion of pedagogy like, starts with these enormous questions for me. Um, most higher education teaching practice, practices are unexamined because teachers are rarely given the space to think about those big questions. They're rarely supported in that work. They're rarely rewarded for that work. They're are rare moments when that work is built into the very fabric and structures of our institutions. We're asked to structure learning as if students are interchangeable. We deliver content, we demand compliance with course policies, and we wield outcomes like a weapon. So I asked a question. Um, I, I've been long curious about, and I've long just made presumptions about how many people get training in higher education pedagogy? How many people who go on to be teachers, educators, librarians, instructional designers, et cetera, et cetera, administrators? How many of us are actually trained in higher education pedagogy? And so I did this poll, and I got a, an amazing number of people responding to it. Dear higher education teachers, a poll. Answer below, reply with stories, and pass along. How much training, in simple, simple question, how much training in teaching or pedagogy was, is included in your graduate program? In some ways, there's lots of different places where we might get this training, but this seemed to me a marker. It seemed to me a signal fire. Um, and the answer was a 52%, so I got 2,800 votes on this. Um, and I really tried to push it beyond my network because at first, you know, my network on Twitter was a group of people who were um, predisposed to think like I do. Um, so I worked really hard to push it beyond my network and feel like I succeeded with 2,800 votes. 52% got basically nothing. 7% um, a week-long intensive, 29% a semester-long seminar, 12% got two-plus seminars or certificate. I can tell you where I think that the range should be, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in a second, but I think it should be right here. Um, and so only 12% of educators are getting this kind of training before they're thrown into a classroom. So some responses. What was even more interesting than the poll itself were the hundreds of responses that I got, specifically asking for people to tell their story. The reason why I think it was so powerful to me was that not just because of the stories that I heard, but because of how eager people were to tell the story, to tell the story about how they wanted to be teachers, but they had they struggled to find the space to do that work. We're in one of those spaces right now. So to some degree, I recognize I'm preaching to the choir. We're in the space where that work is happening. But I think it's useful for us to talk about how unique this space is, how special the work that we're doing here is. And if your institution paid for you to come to this, or supported your travel to this, or gave you a grant, how special that is and how unique that is. Um, so it's just some of the examples of the of the uh, the tweets that I got. Someone, one of my colleagues asked me, because uh, I said, oh shoot, I've just done this poll, and now 36 hours of my life are going to be spent having conversations on Twitter, except for a short maybe six hours for sleeping in the middle of it, because you get hundreds of stories coming at you, and you can't help but have dialogue with people, or at least I can't. So I couldn't let a single one of those tweets go by without letting the person know that I heard them. So lots of like, and it actually 
have time to engage in conversation around every single one. But lots of dialogue around these. And so if you go to my Twitter right now, I've pinned this poll question right at the top. And if you click on it, it will then show you this sort of endless thread of these conversations that emerged around this question. So just a few examples. I fought for opportunities to teach and was told, quote, spend as little time on teaching as possible so it doesn't interfere with your research. A couple things there, spend as little time, but the interfere with is a really interesting thing to me. The idea that it not only would take time away from your research, but somehow thinking about teaching would get in the way of, of our research. Um, so here another one, in my university, TAs get short training, but since I never was one, I didn't have to do it. I'll be helping this year, so I'll learn a bit about it. In the program, we were told we could take one or two zero credit classes about learning and pedagogy, but it's not mandatory. I did. Uh, so lots of qualifications there. The thing that really interested me was just I, I couldn't get past this idea of zero credit classes. Um, in part, I would have, the phrase I use on another poll that I asked around this was non-credit, I, I said non-credit classes. But somehow her phrasing it as zero credit classes made me think, there's, again, it's a structural issue. To call it a zero credit class basically is a signifier. This is what the institution values. This is what the department values. This is what the discipline values. And these are the things it doesn't value. And the last one here is nothing at all. And ironically, this was a PhD in learning sciences. Uh, worse yet, my research was on teaching in higher ed. But I was neither trained nor experienced. I suspect such a lack of deep engagement contributes to technocratic and teacher-proof approaches to research and reform. Um, so this is the idea that uh, I actually know him. He got a degree in higher education, teaching and learning, specifically at expertise in learning sciences, was thrown into a classroom with absolutely no training in teaching. And that's common. Um, my friend Sarah Goldrick Rabb talks about the fact she's come to Digital Pedagogy Lab, an event that I, I teach at every summer in University of Mary Washington, and she told me uh, she's an expert in higher education policy. Y many of you probably know her and know how astounding and important her work is. Um, first time she came, she said, I never got any training in teaching or pedagogy. I was thrown into a classroom and expected to teach as an expert in higher education with no training in how to teach higher education students. Um, so here's another poll. This is a similar poll done by a, a, another Twitter uh, friend of mine, Jennifer Polk. And she asked a similar question, although slightly different, also got a similar number of responses. She got 20. 300 responses. She asked, did you get any training, pedagogical training, any teacher pedagogical training in grad school for TAs or instructors before you taught or facilitated in classrooms? This time, 44% none. I think it's probably because mine asked, said basically none. And so basically none allowed in like a three hour workshop where you learned how to use the copy machine. Uh, which honestly, those are the kinds of stories that I had to deal with across those 36 hours that that passed for teacher training or was called teacher training. 37% uh, some limited usefulness, 12% decent amount in quality, 7% yep, great training. There's a, quality, there's a quality thing in her question that I think is valuable. Mine just asked about the amount. Hers, the answers imply, was it good? Was it helpful? So I asked a series of other questions that also got into that. And again, if you click on that tweet, you can see some of the other poll questions I've answered. And actually, uh, about three or four of them are still open. So feel free to go on there and answer, answer the questions that are still active. Oh, so here's a, like, like talk about compassion. Um, this is, like, I put this up here and I feel kind of cheeky. Like, I, I've written this in an article. I felt kind of cheeky when I did. But it actually kind of still cuts. Um, I was I, talking to a colleague, and I just put my modest proposal on the table that if 40 to 90% of the work of a faculty member, 40% if you're at a research institution or at least you have a teaching role at a research institution, 90% if you're at a smaller college or a teaching focused college, if 40 to 90% of the work of a faculty member is teaching, why wouldn't 40 to 90% of graduate training be focused on teaching? And I actually, I remember being laughed at. And I remember being like, wait, why are you laughing? Like, why is that actually funny? I get why the structural 
system that we've created doesn't really make space for that. And I get why it seems like a lot to go from zero to 40 to 90%, but it isn't actually funny. I don't think it's absurd at all. It just seems like a, it, why not have that conversation about why that isn't the case? Turns out the internet agrees with me. Yay, internet. Um, this, I will point out, is a much smaller sample. Fewer people answered this question, so I don't necessarily know that this trafficked beyond my network significantly. You can all still answer this one, though. This one is still active. Uh, 350 people, and um, I basically ask, if we just decided that pedagogical training was going to be part of every, uh, every graduate degree program, how much? And uh, it looks like 20% said 40% or more. 36% said 30% of coursework, 31% said 20%, and only 13% said 10% or less of coursework. And usually the 10% or less, I get into conversations with most of the people who answer this or tell, you know, give more details. Usually that less than 10% are people who say, but wait, a lot of our PhDs go on to do things other than teaching. They go on to manage labs, or they go on to do 100% research positions, or they go and they work in the public, in the public sector, or the private sector. And my, my answer to that is usually, well, if we assume that res learning advanced research skills is useful for people who go into 90% teaching positions, why wouldn't we assume that teaching skills are useful to people who go into non-teaching positions? It seems pretty transferable, a lot of the skills. We assume that research skills are transferable. Why would we assume that teaching skills or pedagogy isn't also transferable? If rich conversations about teaching don't happen in graduate programs, they are very unlikely to happen among teaching faculty and at disciplinary conferences. One of the things that I would argue is there's lots of different places we could put this. Um, we could put it as I, uh, not that one, let me go back. We could put it in first year faculty initiatives, um, which is a move uh, expanding pretty rapidly in the UK and in uh, Australia in particular, where someone starts with no training, but in their first teaching job, they're required to do a significant amount of training. Um, we could also put it in continuing faculty development programs. In some ways, I think we need to put it in all of these places. There's also just the informal value of learning on the job. It's not to say that I don't think there's value in sometimes being thrown into something, not knowing what you're doing. But even with a year of pedagogical training before I started teaching, I still had that feeling. I still had that experience of being thrown in and learning on the job and learning on my feet. But the, essentially, the, the pedagogical training I had before I started helped me feel confident and resilient when I, went to, when I got to that space. Um, so here's my argument. Um, we need higher education pedagogy or inter, we need departments of higher education pedagogy or interdisciplinary clusters of scholars focused on higher education pedagogy at every school offering graduate degrees aimed at preparing future faculty. I would actually go even further than this to say, why wouldn't we also have those department and teaching intensive colleges that are focused on undergraduates? Um, huge numbers, 52% or more of the teachers at those teaching intensive institutions are unlikely to have had any pedagogical training. At least they're usually predisposed or interested in teaching, otherwise they wouldn't get those jobs, but they've usually experienced six to eight years of being told that they shouldn't want a teaching intensive job. Um, not necessarily always, not necessarily at every institution, but more often than not, the stories that I hear are people being told, you shouldn't think about teaching, you should want to be a researcher at a large research institution. Um, so what would this mean? What are the practicalities of this department? How would it change the structures of our institution? Again, these look really far from where we're at currently, but I think we're moving in this direction. Um, one, offering more courses or components of required content-focused courses dedicated to pedagogy. One person asked me, well, if, if there's a re required course in pedagogy, it just becomes that required course that everyone feels they have to take, even if they have no interest in teaching. My answer to that is that graduate programs tend to have uh, you know, like you have to take a course, so if it, you're in a literature grad program, you have to take a course in 20th century literary theory, and then you pick the course within that that fits your needs and your personal interests. So why couldn't we have a pedagogy-focused um, component of degree requirements that allowed you to pick 
the right class if you're going to go on to manage a lab. It could include leadership classes. It could include classes about how to run a nonprofit. It could include classes on teaching and learning. It could even include classes on like performance or communication. Could all fit into that. Uh, so that in a sense, people still get to prepare themselves for the jobs that they actually want, but they're also preparing themselves for the jobs they don't know that they want, but they might get. I know a lot of the graduate classes I took were focused, were, I took them because I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grow up. I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. And I took them in order to explore different ways of thinking and different approaches and mindsets. So discipline as specific pedagogies would be a significant component of comprehensive or qualifying exams. This one I think is valuable as much as 40% of the dissertations or research projects in a field would focus at least in part on pedagogy. I studied pedagogy, higher education pedagogy all throughout my humanities degree. When I got to the dissertation, and I was really supported in that work. When I got to the dissertation phase, I was basically told, no, that really won't work. That won't pass muster. So I had to write a dissertation that is connected. My dissertation's about embodiment and technology. So it connects to my work related to pedagogy, but it isn't about pedagogy. Uh, and essentially, I did that because I thought, oh, this sounds fun to write. I'll just write it so that I don't have to deal with the people continuing to tell me, like, but wait, what's your field? How does this actually express what your field is? Um, and the last one, that the culture of every department would acknowledge pedagogy as a respected subdiscipline and a discipline in its own right. I think one of the tr reasons we have trouble talking about higher education pedagogy as a thing, as a field, is because it sits in this weird place that it's both a field in its own right and also a subdiscipline of every other field. And I think there's a way in which it feels like the Borg, like the higher education pedagogues will, will consume you and turn you in, you know, because it, because it has its tendrils in everything else. I think that's what makes it so great. Uh, it makes it such an interesting field, but it also becomes a little inscrutable. It doesn't fit neat and tidily into containers. I'm skipping a few here. Uh, actually, I'm going to go with this one. Uh, the bureaucracies of education. Seat time, accreditation, grades, credentialing, standards, norming, encourage teachers to imagine students work the way machines do, that they can be scored according to objective metrics and neatly compared to one another. In some ways, that's the same thing we do with ourselves. We try and put ourselves in a neat and tidy box. I'm the guy who's here to talk about X. I'm the guy that's here to talk about Y. Instead of let, letting all the complicated stuff about ourselves sit alongside one another. If there's a better sort of mechanism for the work of education, it's a machine, an algorithm, a platform tuned not for delivering and assessing content, but for helping all of us listen better to students. I'm going to make a little bit of a transition here, moving from talking about the messages that I got about what teaching is, how valuable teaching is, the failures to train um, many higher education teachers in how to teach, and shift a little bit towards the experience that our students are having. Uh, and, and I want to say that we can't get to a place of listening to students if they don't show up to the conversation. Because we've excluded their voice in advance by creating environments hostile to them and their work, one of the things I want to argue is that the same the same system that reduces the work of teaching, that makes the work of teaching increasingly precarious, is the system that turns our students into customers, that turns our students into just rows in a spreadsheet, turns their work into columns in a spreadsheet. These are, we're sort of, the system is being pushed on from both sides. Um, I've also, a big piece of my research right now is about student shaming. Um, and, I'm, and I'm, for the first time, trying to connect my arguments about the future of teacher preparation, the future of faculty development, the future of teaching centers and departments of higher education pedagogy. I asked myself for this presentation, like, how does that sit next to my work related to student shaming? What do they have to do with one another? Um, so some statistics. 62% of higher education faculty and staff stated they'd been bullied or witnessed bullying versus 37% in the general population. People from minority computer com uh, communities are disproportionately bullied, of course. Um, and not, of course, in the sense that, oh, yes, we can just say that. But of course, that's probably where we start in our advocacy and our activism work. 
I'm thinking to myself about those messages that I had up on the screen about the value of teaching, about what, what I was told I, wanted to, I should want to do when I grew up, and what I actually wanted to do when I grow up. And while I wouldn't necessarily describe every message sent to me as a kind of bullying, I think there is a sort of bullying and shaming about the, of the work of teachers that underlie those messages. So, college students. 51% of college students claim to have seen another student being bullied by a teacher at least once. And 18% claim to have been bullied themselves by a teacher. That's a lot of people. So when you're looking out at your class of 30, uh, oh shoot, I just, I'm gonna do, I have to do math. That's like five, it's like five or six. So when you, right, I think, when you look at, I'm not a mathematician. When you look out at your class of 30 students, Five or six of those students have experienced bullying directly. Fifteen to six of them have witnessed that bullying. So every moment it gives me a chance to like catch my breath. Um, I think I, no, I didn't skip to you. Let me get some water. So I said this a bit, but I'll just repeat it for emphasis. The process that makes teachers increasingly adjunct is the same process that has made students into customers. And the gear that makes this system go depends on the pitting of students and teachers against one another. Not training higher education teachers is a powerful lever in this system, a powerful enabler of the system that I'm about to describe. Three years ago, I wrote a blog post. Three years ago, I wrote a blog post responding to a series of student shaming articles published at the Chronicle of Education. Um, the piece was called Dear Chronicle. If you Google Dear Chronicle Stommel, you can find this piece. In short, this was my argument in that piece. Everyone working anywhere, even near, it was a bit anthemic. The piece was a little, it was more anthemic than I, I just wrote it on a Saturday morning. I saw this piece, another one of these student shaming pieces come out in the Chronicle of Higher Education. And just on a Saturday morning, I was just like, I just gotta write about this. And it became much more, I meant it as just a, you know, just a little, little small Saturday morning piece. You don't publish a blog post on Saturday morning and expect people to read it. It was relatively anthemic. And so everyone working anywhere even near to education needs to, Treat the least privileged, privileged among us with the most respect. Recognize the job of a teacher is to advocate for students. Um, I would go so even, even further now to say that teachers, the work of teaching is a kind of activism. Laugh at ourselves and not at those we and our system have made most vulnerable. And I think that that goes for also shaming teachers. When I talk about student shaming, I never, my intention is never to shame teachers. I think that there's, as I've described, there's a system that we're embroiled in that creates the perfect environment for a really hostile relationship. Um, and last, rant up, not down. My blog post was read by 50,000 people and uh, it spawned articles and it spawned blog posts and hundreds of responses. I actually ended up shutting down comments on my blog after the experience that I had around this. Because interestingly, what happened is that my post about student shaming led to me experiencing the most violent bullying that I've experienced, violent public bullying that I've experienced from other teachers. Um, and the next two slides are the two I would also prefer you not to share because they are some pretty hideous, horrendous things that were said about me. There's lots of cussing. And there also is lots of extraordinarily demeaning things about students contained in just one of the articles. So this, this website, which is thankfully now defunct, called um, College Misery, uh, had they ended up over the course of two weeks writing 10 to 15 articles about me. And those articles, to the point, had so many readers where those articles for years have showed up on the first page of my search results. When you just Google Jesse Stommel, you see the headline that you're about to see on this next page. And um, don't click on it. Like Google, Google my name if you want to see if it's still there, but don't click on it because that'll keep it moving up. I've actually watched it move down and I want it to keep moving down. The one that's still in the front page is not the really bad one. It's called, uh, the one that's still there has the t headline, I'm just so baffled and blue about Jesse Stommel. Um, 
This one is not that, fr that's actually kind of cheeky and funny. This one's not cheeky and funny. Um, so I'm actually gonna read this to you all, and it um, includes lots of foul language. In part, I'm gonna read it to you all so that we can sit with the kind of language that is used to describe teachers and the kind of language that's used to describe students. So the, the title of the piece is Dear Dr. Stommel, Fuck You. Dr. Stommel, fuck you. No, seriously, fuck you. Why don't you get down off of your high horse and join us down here in the trenches? Even the idea that the work of teaching and learning would be something that happens in the trenches. Um, we're just one sentence in, and it gets worse. Maybe then your views wouldn't be so skewed by your rose-colored division of continuing studies glasses. I guess when your students are two or three day at a time lifelong learners, you can afford to be innovative. You can afford to be experimental with your courses. You can go without giving grades. Try teaching freshman composition to 30 mouth breathers day in and day out. Those that need to be dragged kicking and screaming toward having a critical thought on anything. Question, do you have a Jesse Stommel in your department? So it's something that spreads. Um, is there anything to be done about his kind? There's another page, and it gets worse. You see, pretentious ass clown. Can I call you pretentious ass clown? And some of this is actually funny. Like, I can't help but read this, but find it f certain moments funny. But then I'm pulled back into what is the thinking that underlies the creation of a piece like this. Venting is what keeps me from going batshit crazy, wondering if I made the right choices in life. It's what keeps me from drinking more than I already do to forget the agony of apathy in my classroom. I've spent way too much time on this. I guess I'll conclude with, fuck you. Fuck you and the unicorn you rode in on. Fuck you with the unicorn you rode in on. P.S. Fuck you. Um, so, and it's funny, I'm fine with you laughing at it. I need it to be funny. But it's interesting that when I got to that, I actually had to have it pointed out to me that there's a homophobic slur inside of there. Um, and, and I partly had to have it pointed out to me because um, I gave a keynote uh, a year ago at uh, um, Digital Pedagogy Lab in Vancouver and talked a little bit about the experience, the experiences I've had with homophobia. And it's been so internalized that when I got to that line, I didn't like it just seemed that seemed like a day at the beach. Um, that seemed like an ordinary day to me. And so I didn't even didn't even occur to me that there would be homophobia underlying that. So the language used about students, the language used about teaching, the image that this creates of the work of teaching. The Dear Student articles weren't the first published at the Chronicle to demean students, and they weren't the last. The first sentence of an article published more recently, and I point to this sentence because I'm showing you extreme examples, but it's there, the same thinking about the work of teaching and the work of students is here just in this. My students can't write a clear sentence to save their lives. You've probably seen that before. You might have even said that. It's a kind of frustration that happens. But the shift when, the, or a frustration that's I, I, natural, and a frustration, a, a kind of venting that we often need to express. I'm not opposed to venting. We get frustrated. We vent. We don't vent on the pages of the Chronicle of Education. We don't vent in department meetings. We don't vent in front of rooms of people like this about students. The Chronicle profits in, by encouraging a culture that pits vulnerable students and teachers against each other. So here's another lever arm in this re hostile relationship, the fact that it's also driven by profit, that the Chronicle profits when you have these dumpster fire articles. Nobody wins, not students, not teachers, not education in the eyes of its detractors. Who in our educational system is most vulnerable? Intersectionality is important when talking about power and hierarchies. Teacher-student is a binary that needs deconstructing, but never at the expense of other identities in play. Race, class, gender, sexuality, ability, etc. No binary exists in a vacuum. What I listened to intently during the aftermath of Dear Chronicle were student voices, some of whom commented anonymously on my original article. 
Part of the reason why I never asked, and these are actually harder for me to read. Uh, these are actual stories. And I'll tell you that when I read these stories, I'm not even let you, letting you see the worst of them because some of the stories that I've heard are so bad that I don't feel comfortable talking about them in the front of the room, not because I'm nervous to talk about them, but because these are their stories, their stories to tell, and their stories that they're given so few places to tell. Part of the reason why I never asked for help was because I saw what my professors thought of those who did. I dropped out of college in large part due to the hoops I had to jump through to get my disabilities recognized. It's a lot easier to stay motivated when you're not made to feel like you're stupid or a liar. It's a lot easier to focus on studying when you're not focused on having to justify yourself. So a couple things I would say at this point is that I don't think compassion can be scaffolded. Um, and also, I think that the work of compassion is pedagogical. You can see that in what they're saying here. I would learn better if my teachers knew me, they saw me. Same thing with teaching. I would teach better if my administration, the system, the structure, my department saw me, understood who I was, understood what I wanted to be. When I said that I wanted to be a higher edge, when I said, when, often when I say my research area is higher education pedagogy, people say, but what's your field? What's your discipline? I've gotten that for so many years that I've had to just make up fields and disciplines. <laughs> you know those little show and tells where you go around, and I don't mean to demean them, they're fun. Those little show and tells where you go around and say your name and also say what you're working on. Um, I've had to make up so many different things for that because when I, if I say higher education pedagogy, people are like, what? Um, and so I just, make, I just make shit up so that it like, keeps, the, keeps the conversation moving. There are other things I like, and so I can just say one of them. Horror film, technology, embodiment, hooray, documentary film. Um, so for education to work, there can be no divide. I, I just skipped a quote. All, all of my slides are online. I skipped a quote by Sean Michael Morris, wonderful, wonderful colleague for, of mine. Um, for the sake of time, I want to have time for Q&A. For education to work, there can be no divide between teachers and students. There must be what Paula Freire calls teacher students. Again, this is another one of those quotes, sections of his work that I find confounding and interesting and wondrous and curious. Um, teacher dash students. Specifically, he writes, no one teaches another, nor is anyone self-taught. So teacher becomes a role that shifts and learning depends upon a community of teacher students. I think that this is why I'm connecting this work about the messages teachers get and the messages students get about the work of teaching and learning. It's because it's the same system and it's the same structure. It comes from the same place. It's the same conversation that those are happening within. Um, Making space for student voices doesn't start by comparing them to insects. Do you in Canada have this idea of grade grubbing? How many people have heard the phrase grade grubbing? Um, not many, good. In the US, people love to talk about grade grubbing. Um, grade grubbing essentially means that students come to your office hours and they say, can I get a grade, can I get a grade, can I get an A? And that's the way it gets talked about. I'm, I, I, like, I'm doing that ironically. Um, because I've not actually had it happen exactly like that. But this phrase grade grubbing, I mean, that's not where a conversation, where a genuine, authentic relationship between teacher and student starts, by comparing them to an insect. And if you actually Google the grub and look into the etymology of the word and you look at some of the urban dictionary definitions of the word grub, you find out what, this, what underlies this um, moniker. So give some thought, to uh, thought and a Google search the words grub and grubber, and I suspect you'll stop attributing these words to students. So I want to end with um, a, a recent question that I posed to the internet, a, a recent tweet that I sent out about another series of discussions around students' dead grandmothers. Um, you've probably heard these debates about dead grandmothers. Oh, there's more dead grandmothers around exam time. Um, supposedly, and you've probably seen some of the, the sort of flip ways people talk about dead grandmothers. Students with dead grandparents is not a funny joke. Um, there was a very viral tweet that went out, which I'm not going to share here, that was shared, uh, I think at the last time I looked, it had been liked something like 800,000 times and shared something like 200,000 times, so it had gone well outside of education circles. Students feel they have to lie to teachers because teachers turn the complexity of their lives into a punchline. To encourage honesty, approach students with empathy. 
Teachers are in a real and increasing position of precarity, but we should be speaking truth to the power, dismantling the systems in education that pit us against one another, not doing harm to the most vulnerable among us. And I'm gonna show you some, again, this is a bit hard, I'm gonna show you some examples of the stories that students told. Another situation where I spent about 30, actually this one went on for days, where I was hearing these stories. And there, there's a level of story that when you get it, I, I'm actually just not capable of hearing these kind of very personal stories and then not responding and interacting. Um, I'm often told, well, you need to tune out, you need to shut off Twitter, but like, the tweets, the stories keep coming at my Twitter, even when I'm not looking at them. Um, and these are stories I don't feel can go without someone saying, I hear you. Um, and again, they rise well above what I'm willing to share with you here. If I do it behind my back. There we go. I went to my math teacher in eighth grade and tried to tell him I thought I had dyscalculia. Dyscalculia. I was ignored. He literally grimaced and turned away from me and not diagnosed until age 21 after repeating pre-algebra level math six times. Where would I be if I was listened to sooner? I saw the dead grandparents tweet and it reminded me of the time my, my body was literally reacting to stress by breaking out in hives during exam time. My prof didn't believe me, so I showed up to my exam with a swollen face and hands. Damn, this is so true. As a black student, I often feel I can't ask for help or even admit when I am not sure of the answers to a question. I'm judged much more harshly than my peers. And you often have to work three times as hard for your teachers to respect you. My grandmother passed away this semester, the day before Parkland, where my little brother lost a friend. I missed a non-essential class to fly home early for the funeral to be with my family. The professor essentially punished me with extra work. I felt so disrespected. I will always, always remember, three always, I will always, always, always remember when I finally got my guts together to ask for an extension on my paper because I'd just gotten on antidepressants and ADHD meds and the prof was like, eh, sure, you can turn it in late. You'll just have points docked. My psych prof. <laughs> and this is where I'm gonna end. All of this demands exactly two pedagogical approaches and these are what I see at the center of the work of teaching. One. Start by trusting students. Two, realize fairness is not a good excuse for a lack of empathy. Thank you. So we've got 10 minutes for Q&A. I was amazed to see that how good the timing was. Look at, she put up her hands, and I was like, and I'm done. Um, so questions, comments, thoughts, stories. I think there's microphones. There's microphones going around, so, uh, so there are other people on the other side of the room can hear you wait for the microphone. I'll, I'll point to someone, and then he'll run around. Your presentation reminded me of a B.Ed. student that I had who was in a course in another faculty, and so this student who commuted with me um, from Salt Spring into um, VIU said to me, you know, I'm being taught about good pedagogy, and then I'm in this class, and he said, I don't know what to do about this. Is there a way that we could create a safe space for undergraduate B.Ed. students to be seen mm -hmm. as a resource, the stuff that they're learning um, to be shared with a higher education profs. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, my answer to that is that I think that there is a weird division at many institutions between schools of education and then teaching and learning centers. There's a weird division in some cases between the faculty development units and the school of education. And if I were to imagine a department of higher education pedagogy, it would really be geared at bridging the work, bridging the work that's happening in schools of education and the work that's happening in teaching and learning centers. And one of the things that I think is crucial, and it's kind of all over this, how do we create structures that get more students to events like this? 
There are students here, mostly the students who are here, I've been told, are students who are presenting here. And so people they work with, colleagues that they work with, educators are drawing them this, to this event. But how do we create spaces where we're essentially learning from students about the work of teaching and learning? Um, so yes, we should do that. Is that <laughs> kind of an answer to your question? Um, other thoughts? There, over there. Click. So I, I was just wondering um, what you think might be the, where having empathy for your students um, and, hap and having empathy and being able to um, make something actually happen because of that, not just I feel empathetic about your problem, I have 80 students in this class, therefore no. Uh, yeah. wh where do we hit the practical line and is it a matter of also working towards restructuring post-secondary into reasonable numbers, yeah. reasonable work environments that make um, empathy not just a, a personal issue, but something that can have an impact in the way you teach. Yeah. Well, so there's an interesting question underlying there, which I think we could probably talk about for the rest of this event, which is, I said that you can't scaffold empathy, but I also wonder the degree to which you can scale empathy or systematize empathy or systematize compassion or um, scaffold compassion. And I think that the answer is that for the most part, no. I think what you can do is have lots of conversations about the things, the systems we've already created that are getting in the way of empathy or compassion. And one of the things I think also is important is to ask ourselves what, I, I sort of loosely moved back and forth between the word empathy and the word compassion in my talk today, but I think it's worth sussing out the difference between those and what we mean by them. Uh, the word empathy, I actually love the word empathy, but there's a reading of the word empathy that I think can be problematic, and that is the idea that you can know, not that you can know, but that you can feel exactly what someone else is feeling. And I think that we have to break that down and say, no, essentially, I can't feel exactly what you're feeling. Um, I'm a gay teacher. Um, I've been teaching for 19 years. I teach at a particular kind of institution. I, particular, I, I teach particular kinds of students. I'm not going to feel, be able to feel what, uh, what a teacher of color uh, might experience in their classroom. And so instead, I think it's about dialogue and conversations so that we can find out what's actual, what our different experiences are. So a lot of talking is what I would say. And I come from a family of psychologists and therapists. And so I think a lot of communication skills uh, would be valuable so that we can, in a sense, sit with each other authentically. Um, there's a hand right, right behind. Thank you, Jesse, for your talk this morning. It was, it was so fitting. A uh, few colleagues and myself recently um, uh, co-authored a chapter, actually, on pedagogical values, speaking about the pedagogy of care and the work of Noddings, mm -hmm. as well as the pedagogy of diversity, mm -hmm. um, community, and justice. And so this is a very fitting talk, and I'm so happy to see that we're not alone in this. So what I wanted to say is there are so many competing demands for faculty um, and instructors when they come into higher education space. Again, part of it is because their training in their graduate programs aren't necessarily preparing them for the space. Mm -hmm. So there are demands for learning about the institutional culture, if there's a learning and teaching model at that institution. There's learning about the technologies. There's learning about the academic policies and procedures, et cetera. So what would be your elevator pitch to senior administration mm -hmm. at an institution and why they should prioritize um, pedagogy of, of care yep. and all of these other fantastic things you've spoken about today? Um, ele my elevator pitch. So uh, before that, I'll say a, a question that, well, a, a conversation that I recently had at my own institution. And I was advocating for the exact thing that I'm gonna use as an answer to your question, which is what I was calling a first year faculty experience. And essentially modeled after freshman experiences where there's a cohort of freshmen who re have a common read in some cases at my, at my institution, they have a common read. And they kind of track together and talk about their experience of the first year together throughout the first year. I was advocating for a first year faculty experience 
which would be a sense in which you have all the first year faculty become a cohort that goes through that first year together. Um, the answer that I got back was they're so overwhelmed in their first year, why not do that the second year? And I guess my answer to is that they actually need it the first year exactly because they're so overwhelmed. So my answer is that it seems like it takes more time, but I think it actually saves time. For example, if someone has gotten no pedagogical training and they're thrown into a classroom, they may think, wow, I'm so overwhelmed. I don't have time to, actually, to also go to pedagogical seminars or to seminars focused on diversity in the classroom or to seminars focused on care in the classroom. But I think what we need to argue is that all of those things save time. They don't make time. Honestly, Emotional labor is something I spend a lot of my life doing, a lot of time at my institution doing in some ways because I can't not do it. But I think empathy takes less time than turning students into machines. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to describe. It saves time because I can let go. There's something about when you're staring at a spreadsheet and you're trying to get all the ones and zeros to line up that for me, it feels effortless the second that I can just engage with students as human beings. Um, does that sort of answer your question? I guess the pitch that I would make is that talking about teaching and learning, spending time talking about teaching and learning makes it easier to teach. Um, makes it easier to teach well, um, I'll say. Thank you. Just. There's one back there and there's one over, over there. Yeah. Hi, Jesse. My name's Gina. Hi, Gina. Um, I want to thank you very much for your presentation. Um, and my question to you is this. I think that it took a lot of courage um, and a lot of heart and a willingness to be really vulnerable to be able to give the kind of presentation that you shared with us today. And I'd love to um, be able to, I guess, inspire and ignite some of those conversations where I work. Mm -hmm. But again, I think that it's asking a lot of faculty um, to have those conversations because institutions, our institutions, I think, aren't really built on vulnerability yeah. um, mm -hmm. and in yeah. lots of ways aren't built on openness. And so I think what you're asking, I mean, um, you know, I think is about the, the heart of the work and mm -hmm. how do you, do you have any ideas about yeah. how to help um, facilitate that? I think the thing that I would want to make really Thank clear. Thank you. The thing I'd want to make really clear is that vulnerability, the ability to be vulnerable is not distributed equally. It's not distributed equally because there's something much safer about being at the front of a room with all eyes on you. It seems like it would be harder to be vulnerable, but it, in some ways it makes it easier to be vulnerable. There's a position of power. I'm holding a particular seat here that allows me to be vulnerable. People at your institution don't necessarily hold that same seat. And it's also not distributed equally because women are much more likely to be taken advantage of when they're vulnerable. Their emotional labor is more likely to be taken advantage of. Um, students are more likely to be punished for acts of vulnerability. And so what I guess I would say is that there needs to be, it sort of needs to be two things at once. There needs to be a grassroots effort where we support one another at our institutions, where teachers and students band together in order to do this kind of work and create spaces to do, to be vulnerable together. Um, and to me, I think that that can happen in the classroom. Um, that classroom is a space where that kind of work can happen. But I also think it has to be top down in the sense that there has to be advocacy at the administration level. There has to be a clear sense that your act of vulnerability is going to be protected from on high. Um, especially when we think about the tenure system. I've had so many people say, I couldn't be honest about this or that until I had tenure. Um, and I think that that's a really strange position to put ourselves in higher education. You spend seven years not being able to be vulnerable, and then you get tenure, and then we expect that the person will feel comfortable or at ease being vulnerable. Um, or the same thing with compassion. Well, I can't be compassionate because I have to be rigorous during these seven years in order to get tenure. To imagine that somehow you get tenure, and then you'll be compassionate once that's over. So I guess that my answer is, top both from both directions. Um, thank you. Um, we might have time for one more question, but I think we're actually officially out of time. But there was one more hand back here. I'll just say, we'll, we'll do it quickly. Okay, I'll try to be quick. Can you hear me? Yeah, <laughs> okay, first of all, thank you so much. I recently did some 
research where I interviewed students mm -hmm. about um, what helped them when the, when the challenges got really difficult, when the going mm -hmm. got tough. And one of the mm -hmm. main things that they mentioned was a teacher that cares. Yeah. And it isn't a big deal yeah. uh, to care for your students. And it's not just um, with our minds, with our whole bodies, with our um, yeah. ways that we communicate in small ways that makes it really important. So yeah. thank you for that. Yeah. I had some uh, questions kind of came to my mind um, when I was reading those very negative comments with the <laughs> difficult language. I wondered what was making those people respond in that way. Yeah. And I, in myself, I thought, well, maybe I could be empathetic and understanding yeah. of their position, Absolutely. what they're going through, that obviously there's something very difficult going yeah. on in their lives that um, we need to be compassionate about and yeah. support teachers who are doing fantastic work and they're obviously overwhelmed. So yeah. do you have a comment about that? Yeah, I would just say that um, I, I know where a lot of their, uh, where the anxiety that underlied those pieces came from. And I have sort of conflicted relationships with the stories that they tell. It has a lot to do with precarity. And so another piece of my research has been on academic precarity and the fact that the way that, the, so the way work is structured um, across higher education is such that increasingly the work itself is precarious. The work itself doesn't include basic things we should expect of work like healthcare, for example. And so there's a sense in which their sense of self, their sense of who they are, and their basic bodily health, their ability to keep working is at risk. So when 75% of the academic workforce is precarious or contingent or adjunct, I think that that's a system that's rife for the kinds of stuff that's going on there. So I utterly agree with you, huge amounts of empathy. Um, I'm happy to chat with you. I'm going to be here for three days, so I'm going to have fun chatting with you all over the course of three days. Thank you so much.